Hi, everyone, and welcome to the volunteer training for the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count. I'm Emma Pelton at the Xerces Society, and I lead our Western Monarch work. I'll be joined today by Katie Hedela Henschel, a fellow conservation biologist who helps coordinate the Thanksgiving Count. So for a brief overview of what today's volunteer training is going to cover, we're gonna go over really briefly basics about monarch biology and migration. If you really wanna learn more about monarch biology and migration, we recommend checking out a previous webinar that we developed for Monarch Joint Venture called Western Monarch Population Down by 99%, How You Can Help. That was delivered this past February in 2019, and you can find it on MJV's website or on the NCTC training website with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We'll also go in briefly to Western monarch population and the decline we've seen in this population. And then finally, I'll kick it to Katie to talk about the nuts and bolts of participating in the Western monarch Thanksgiving count, which will make up the bulk of this webinar. As a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with us at the Xerces Society, we coordinate the Thanksgiving count along with uh, one of the count's founders, Mia Monroe. But here at Xerces, this is a photo of our staff taken at a recent retreat in Portland, Oregon, where we're based. But we have staff all over the country. And our main conservation programs include pollinators, where we work extensively with farmers and ranchers and other private landowners to put pollinator habitat back on the landscape. Our endangered species program, which Katie and I are a part of, we work on a wide variety of endangered species, including monarchs, including freshwater mussels, bumblebees, uh, fireflies, and other at-risk species. We have an aquatic conservation program folded into our endangered species program. We work on caddisflies and other freshwater dependent species. And our pesticide program, which really intersects with a lot of our work. We're an international nonprofit with over 50 staff spread across the United States. We work in policy, advocacy, advocacy, education, research, and really on the ground conservation, putting habitat back on the landscape. If you wanna learn more about Xerces or donate, you can check out our website, www.xerces.org. So jumping right into the monarch life cycle, you may already know some of these basics, but to get everyone up to speed, monarchs really rely on milkweed as their host plant is the only food that monarch caterpillars can eat to develop and become butterflies. They're specialists of the plants in this family of milkweed, Asclepidaceae. And monarch eggs are laid individually on milkweed, on milkweed plants by the female adult monarchs. They tend to lay them individually. So the second photo is a monarch egg. A few days later, that egg becomes more clear and you can start to see the head capsule, which you can see in the third photograph, which is a, that dark, near the top of the, the egg. So that's an egg that's about to hatch and that caterpillar is about to emerge. So after a few days when that emerges, you see that first instar caterpillar, which is quite small and looks a little bit different than the other caterpillar stages. So caterpillars go through five instars, five stages, and they molt, molt between each one. They become larger, they're eating more and more milkweed until they can form a chrysalis, which is the pupil stage that then leads them to become an adult butterfly. So during this period when they are a larva, they're feeding exclusively on milkweed, and they're not just getting nutrition, they're also sequestering some of the plant compounds called cardenoloids that are in the milkweed that protect that plant from herbivory. So monarchs have really created this incredible adaptation to actually store some of those cardenoloids inside their body, which makes them toxic to predators, especially vertebrate predators like birds. So this stage lasts between 10 and 14 days, depending on weather, nutrition, and other conditions. And then finally, that last fifth instar caterpillar forms a chrysalis, which is a cryptic green, which is unlike the other stages of their life cycle, where they're trying to warn predators that they are toxic because of those cardenoloids with their bright coloration. When they're in their pupil stage, they don't have a lot of defenses, so they are really cryptic with this green, the light gold on the um, upper portion and a few gold dots at the bottom. They're in that pupil stage going through this incredible transformation to become an adult butterfly. And once that adult butterfly emerges, it doesn't take very long before those wings are dry and that monarch is fully ready to fly, 
to mate, to find milkweed, to nectar, and to continue the migratory cycle. So a general rule of thumb is that from egg to becoming an adult is about a month. So during the summer and spring, adults are living for just a few weeks if they're lucky um, as they move across the landscape. And then that last ge generation, which makes it back to coastal California or in the east, goes to Mexico to overwinter, can live for months. So it's kind of an interesting difference in lifespan between a few weeks and up to what we say eight months, um, depending on how long it takes them to migrate, overwinter, and then return to the breeding grounds the next spring. So that's kind of an overview of the basics of an individual monarch's life cycle. When we look at the overall migration in the United States and Southern Canada. Uh, this map really depicts the overall movement. So there's actually two populations in the lower 48 states. Uh, we've got the eastern population outlined in blue here. This is a population that breeds east of the Rocky Mountains, gets up into Southern Canada, and then every fall returns to central Mexico uh, to multiple overwintering sites and is in and around the state of Michoacan, where they rely on OML fir forests at high elevations to make it through the winter. This is by far the larger population, but today we're really gonna be focusing on the smaller western population, which breeds west of the Rocky Mountains, and then overwinters, um, and a more dispersed number of overwintering sites from Mendocino County, just north of the San Francisco Bay in California, down into Baja, Mexico. We also know from tagging studies in the Southwest that at least some portion of Western monarchs don't just go to California. Some of them actually go and join those Eastern monarchs down near Michoacan in Mexico. So it's kind of an open, open study that's really interesting that these populations are mixing on some level. But for today's purposes, we're really talking about those overwintering sites along the Pacific coast in California and down into Baja, Mexico. And those monarchs, uh, isotopic studies have shown and tagging studies have shown are coming from those Western states. So the Western monarch Thanksgiving count is really vital to understand the status and size of that population, the overwinters on the coast. So as we'll go into more details about how to participate, the overall takeaway is that through the hard work of many of our regional coordinators and our, our volunteers, every year we get a certain number of sites covered. There are over 400 sites known to ever have been used by monarchs um, as overwintering sites along the coast. Any one year we cover a portion of those, anywhere between um, about 70s to over 250 sites are covered. So that's the blue line on this graph, and you'll see that over time, especially in the last 10 years, we've really been covering more and more sites to, thanks to increased volunteer recruitment. And every year we get to total the number of monarchs that the volunteers found. So you'll see when we started in the late 90s, there were a lot of monarchs, even though we weren't covering a lot of sites. And then more recently, you'll see that in 2018, we really had an all-time low of the number of monarchs reported, even though we had our third highest amount of participation in the count. We were covering a lot of sites, but we weren't seeing a lot of monarchs. So this graph is really useful kind of looking at overall trends of participation in the monarchs counted. Because every site is different, you really have to use statistics to understand the trends. And so using that, uh, Cheryl Schultz and other authors have looked at the long-term population trends of the population and seen that since the 1980s, where we have some earlier counts done by biologists before we formally began the volunteer effort of the Thanksgiving count, we have really lost about 99% of our monarchs as of that 2018 number. So we've had this huge decline over time. And to put that in perspective, if you think about the population of LA right now, it's about 4 million. It's a little bit, it's equivalent to the 1980s monarch population estimated in California. Comparing that to this past winter's count, um, the 2018 Thanksgiving count results, we counted less than 30,000 monarchs, which is equivalent to the town of Monterey in California. And if you put those to scale, uh, that circle on the far left of LA, if you combine that with the decline we've seen, it would be this tiny circle on the far right. So we've lost over 99% of our monarchs just in the past about 30 to 40 years. So why do we have this huge decline? 
We're not going to go into that in detail, but some of the big players are a combination of land use change that includes at the overwintering sites. There's a photo of burned eucalyptus trees at an overwintering site in California. We've really had human development um, and changing conditions and degradation of overwintering sites is a massive issue in California. We also have land use change affecting the entire migratory cycle, their breeding and, and nectaring sites. Pesticide use, this includes herbicides and our increased reliance on herbicides in agriculture with genetically modified crops that can handle more regular herbicide applications. And insecticides, uh, which are specifically targeted to kill insects, often used in agriculture, but also used in home gardens and for ornamental purposes, along with um, controlling things like mosquitoes and, and diseases. So pesticide use is really implicated in the loss of a lot of different pollinators, including monarchs. There are also diseases. Um, really understanding how disease interacts with these other threats is an area of active research that probably plays a role. Milkweed limitation is also thought to be important. Um, this has been a particular area of focus uh, in restoration efforts of planting milkweed and restoring milkweed landscape. In the West, we think that milkweed might be most limiting early in the season. So that would be in the spring in California, at February to maybe May period when the monarchs are leaving the overwintering grounds, searching for milkweed. Um, preliminary research is showing that that's probably the time they're most milkweed limited and should be the focus of the most restoration efforts. Nectar limitation, uh, which adult monarchs rely on for fuel to get through their migration and breeding, uh, could be particularly important in the spring when the lipid reserves are lower after the wintering period or in the fall when they really need to build up those reserves to get back to the overwintering sites to make it through the winter. And finally, climate change infuses a lot of these threats um, with added layers of complexity, including the overwintering sites where the historic drought California has gone through has weakened some of the trees and led to degradation of the overwintering sites. More severe storms could lead to direct mortality if there are more late season rain and storm events. And then ongoing things, um, drought, you know, increased duration of wildfire season, increased intensity of wildfires can also be affecting the overall health of the population. If you wanna learn more about Western monarchs, uh, there's a great body of research out there and there are four recent studies that have all come out in 2019 directly related to Western monarchs that I'd recommend you check out. One of them is a perspectives piece that uses the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count data along with other data and talks a bit about Xerxes Western Monarch call to action. So that's called the Western Monarch Population Plummets. It's in a special issue of Frontiers. Another study also in that special issue is host plants and looking at the climate structure and habitat associations of milkweed and monarchs across the West. And this was a partnership between Xerces, the University of Nevada, Reno, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that also relied on community science data to our Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper project. And then finally, there's two great studies out of Idaho. One is a study that really looks at the ecology and the distribution of monarchs across Idaho and Washington. And that was developed by partners at Idaho Department of Fish and Game and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And finally, a climate change scenario study that really looks at current and future potential distributions of milkweed and monarchs in Idaho. All right, so with that overview and background, we're now gonna dive into this Western Monarch Thanksgiving count. Um, we're gonna go through a lot of details on this webinar, and if you don't catch everything and you wanna learn more, we really recommend checking out the website, the Western Monarch Count Resource Center, which can be found at www.westernmonarchcount.org has a lot more resources and copies of all the data sheets we're gonna show you today. So why does the Thanksgiving count matter? Well, it's really the longest running effort to monitor overwintering monarchs in the West. You might see throughout this, we use the shorthand OW for overwintering. Um, it also leads to a centralized data bank to understand the size of these overwintering clusters and their location and any threats or um, conservation actions that are being taken. So we have an access database uh, that you can contact us if you'd like a copy of for planning or research purposes. We also share um, past records with new volunteers for the sites they're going to monitor 
they can get a picture of the background of that site. It's really vital to understanding the population status, which I hope I've made that point as we talked about some of these studies and our understanding of how much this population is in trouble and needs our help. So really that's the core purpose of this, this um, community science effort and I think what's so valuable and why we're so happy to have you all here today. And finally, it provides a spatial picture. So we actually can create maps and we have uh, GIS files or if you use Google Earth, we have KMZ files, which you can also contact us for. Uh, we also have an interactive map that shows about 99% of the sites, uh, all the kind of publicly uh, disposable sites on our website. So you can understand where these sites are and that's really vital for landowners, planners, developers to understand where these sites are and so we can better protect them and we can focus on the most important conservation projects. So with that, to get into the nuts and bolts of how to participate, I'm going to hand this over to Katie. So just one moment as we transition. Great, thanks Emma. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, so I will be going over how to participate in the Thanksgiving count. Um, and can you hear me okay? The audio? Yeah, Katie, we can hear you. Um, your slides aren't Great. shared yet though. So whenever you're ready, just make sure to share. Oh, okay, thank you. That's Yeah. Okay, how's that? Can you see the participating in the count now? I don't see it. Um, let me see if oh. I can. Hmm. Oh, there we go. How about now? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the first step to participating in the Thanksgiving count is to uh, get training, which is why you are tuning in today. So thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and it's also really important to connect with a regional coordinator if you are in a county um, that has a regional coordinator. Um, and if there isn't one specific to your county, you can always reach out to us at Xerces and we can get you um, additional information to help get you trained and up to speed. So um, when you're exploring these options, you can learn um, you can learn more about the count and additional training opportunities by visiting the Western Monarch Count Resource Center, which Emma mentioned earlier. Um, and that's found at westernmonarchcount.org. The website is listed at the top of this page. And there's also an interactive map to see um, if there's an overwintering site near you and a separate map to see if your county has a regional coordinator. Um, so this online training will help you help get you familiar with the count, um, but it's still important to connect with your coordinator or a staff member um, to get that hands-on experience out in the field or to go over any site-specific details. And I'm just gonna check in. Are the slides advancing okay? Yep. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the second step is to familiarize yourself with the count. This means uh, reviewing the data sheets and protocols. Um, so read through these documents carefully. They're available online so you know what type of data to collect, what type of weather conditions are appropriate, and what kind of equipment you will need. Um, we will go over all of these topics during today's presentation. And again, all of this information is available at the Western Monarch Count Resource Center. So if you wanna review it, afterwards on your own or before you go out. So let's start by going over what equipment you'll need. This list is for both the count data sheet that we saw on the last slide and also for habitat assessments, which we will go over later. And you'll need to print data sheets to fill out. Uh, clipboard is helpful, but not necessary. Um, you can use anything hard to write on really a book, a bench, your partner's back would work. 
um, a pen, a pencil, or other writing utensil will be needed, a pair of binoculars so you can see up into trees, monarchs cluster at different heights in trees depending on the structure of the overwintering habitat and how cold the nights get. Um, so they can be quite, quite high up. Um, you'll also need a weather gauge to record the temperature, wind speed, and relative humidity. We typically use something called a Kestrel pocket weather meter for this. Um, we also recommend a GPS unit or a smartphone to document the cluster location. Um, a lot of folks bring a camera or a smartphone to take pictures. And some, some folks, especially if you're going to be doing a habitat assessment form, will find that having a plant ID or field guide is useful as we ask for what nectar plants are available at the overwintering site. Um, and then another optional item, and um, also more important if you're doing both a count and a habitat assessment form, is a compass. And that'll come in handy if you will be recording the aspect or which direction a slope is facing. So after you've gathered your equipment, it's a good time to review the data sheet and the protocol. So we're gonna spend the next couple slides just working through the data sheet. Um, when you're out conducting a survey, you fill out as much of the data sheet as you can and skip any sections that you can't confidently fill out. Um, you'll start with the date you are surveying, the site name and the site ID number. The site ID is the number assigned to the site from the Xerces Monarch Overwintering Database. Both the site name and number can be found on the website uh, under the Find an Overwintering Site interactive map. You can also get this information straight from your regional coordinator or from a Xerces staff member um, if you just send us an email. And our emails um, will be posted multiple times throughout this PowerPoint. Um, so it's always good to double check your site name and number to make sure they match with what you signed up for. Um, so don't hesitate to double check and reach out to us if you have any questions. So next, your name and whoever is counting with you go under the observer section. That survey should be conducted by at least two observers. And your count time should typically be in the early morning. Um, this is because the temperature is lower and there is a higher chance that monarchs are still clustered. So monarchs don't typically start flying until the temperature warms up to above 55 degrees. So it's ideal to conduct your count when it is below 55 um, to optimize the chances of getting a good count because they are still clustered. And the count time will vary depending on your site. Uh, depends on where the clusters are located, how hard the monarchs are to, to find. Um, this can be the case for large overwintering sites or large groves with fewer monarchs. Um, it can also take longer if you have a lot of mo monarchs to count that could be in the thousands. Um, and then the last part of this section is the weather section. So you record the weather at the beginning of your count. And these categories are all pretty self-explanatory. Um, you'll record the percent cloud or fog cover um, for precipitation. You'll circle if it's raining or not. Um, if you're circling that downpour category, then you should reschedule your count for another day. Um, the wind direction is where is to document where the wind is coming from, and then temperature is the last one. Um, so per the protocol, and I just mentioned this already, but survey should not be done during heavy precipitation um, or strong winds. And this is because it reduces your visibility and um, there's an increased chance that butterflies will be scattered or on the ground, kind of making it harder to get an accurate count. So next you want to estimate your cluster size. Um, re you'll record each cluster on a separate row of the data sheet. A cluster is two or, or more adjacent butterflies. Um, for large clusters, count a small area of the cluster and then extrapolate to arrive at a total for the entire cluster. Um, and then you repeat that count to take an average. So you're counting them two separate times um, to get that estimate. 
Um, so we'll go over a couple different scenarios of what this will look like um, in the next couple of slides. And after you've counted and gotten your average, you should check in with your partner because there should be at least two observers. Um, and if your counts are within a 20% margin of each other, um, then you record the average of all observers. However, if your counts vary more than 20%, discuss why, um, like maybe someone missed a group of monarchs or is at an angle where they can only partially see the cluster and then redo the count. Um, you'll, that'll help get a more accurate estimate of how many butterflies are actually in a specific area. Um, so as you're doing your account, you'll also want to record the tree species that the cluster is on. This is commonly uh, blue gum eucalyptus, but it can also include red river gum, Monterey pine, Monterey cypress, um, coastal redwood, coast live oak, western sycamore or willow. Um, so if you could document the tree species, that would be helpful. And lastly, you'll want to estimate how high up on how high up in the tree uh, each cluster is located. And at the bottom of the data sheet under total clustered, we sum up all of the clustered monarchs. So everything that was written down in that first column and you'll see that we track centers, loners, flyers, and grounders separately. So here I wanted to quickly define the different categories. I, cluster is defined as more than two adjacent butterflies. These are likely a cluster that formed from the previous day. Uh, centers are monarchs that are typically separate from the cluster with their wings open. And these are butterflies that likely flew from the cluster to the sunning location. Uh, flyers are monarchs in flight. Loners are defined as one or two monarchs, um, typically with closed wings that would differentiate it from a sunner, um, and they're not associated with the cluster. And then grounders are, would be the number of live monarchs on the ground. Um, they could be puddling or doing some other activity like that. And the grand total is all of these categories combined. So uh, lastly, on this data sheet, um, it'd be great if folks could record any tagged monarchs. Um, if you could report how many in the tag number, that would be great. That way we can report back to the appropriate tagging group. And there is a PDF at westernmonarchcount.org that has pictures of the different tag types and the contact information for each program. So after reading through the protocols and the data sheets, uh, grab your binoculars and head outside to practice. Um, you can pick a branch and a large tree to focus on um, like in your backyard and count leaves, leaves as if they were monarchs. Um, this will help you practice focusing your binoculars and also experience what it might be, look, what it might be like to look up high in a tree and um, focus on individual small butterflies. Um, alternatively, you could coordinate a scouting trip to your overwintering site. Um, this might be helpful because you can learn where to park, how to access your overwintering site, and work through other logistics before the day of the count. Um, so we recommend practicing beforehand, um, whether it's your yard or at an overwintering site, and that'll help troubleshoot any issues that could come up on the day of the count. Um, and it will also help provide high quality data. So the next step, step three here, is to set a couple of potential dates and watch the weather. Survey should be conducted at least once per season, although twice or more would be great. The most important time to count is during the annual Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so make sure you set your date within the three week window around Thanksgiving. And if you can get out a second time, aim for the two week window around the New Year's count. So this year, the Thanksgiving count runs from November 9th through December 1st, and the New Year's count runs from December 28th through January 12th. This time of year is crucial because it is when 
We see monarchs clustering, which makes it easier to estimate their population. Um, by mid to late November, most monarchs have arrived to their overwintering locations and are getting settled in for the season. By having a set time period every year around Thanksgiving, we are able to compare counts at all sites and determine if, average, if the average number of monarchs counted per site is increasing or declining each year. Um, the New Year's count is in its fourth year, um, and it's in late December and early January, and it helps compare the size of, late season, of the late season population, um, which may have changed uh, throughout the overwintering season due to movement between sites, mortality, storms, or a combination of any of those factors. Um, but we encourage people to get out and feel free to establish a weekly, bi-weekly or monthly schedule throughout the monarch overwintering season. Um, you could start counts as early as October if you were so inclined, and that would help capture data on when they arrive at overwintering sites and counts later in the season, typically into the first week of March, um, will help us track when they're leaving overwintering sites. So um, we're always encouraging people to collect. The more data, the better. Um, so now that you're ready to monitor your site and count, we're going to take the next couple of minutes to run through examples of monarchs clustering on different tree species. And first we're going to look at a Monterey pine branch in the picture here. And you can see that there are multiple clusters across the photo. So if you look at the left in the shaded area and move across to the right, you'll see more clusters that yeah, all the way into the sunny part of the branch. And the first thing to do is to identify the different clusters before you start counting. So We've circled a cluster here in red, just to point one out. And then as we work across the photo from right to left, we can see that there are seven clusters and it's helpful to break them up like this um, to make counting a little bit easier. So we're gonna zoom in to one of the clusters and count individual monarchs. Um, I'd like to point out that we are a little bit limited here by looking at a flat one-dimensional photo. Each cluster will be different when you are there in person. And if you can get more than one angle of a cluster, that is recommended if you can view it from more than one angle. So um, by looking up from underneath it, you can get an idea of how dense it is or if there is more than one layer of monarchs. Um, if you can pick out one monarch from one side and keep an eye on it, as you move to the other side of the cluster, you know that it is just one layer deep. That's one way to approach it. Um, but we'd recommend counting a cluster from at least two angles. Um, but so even though we're limited by this online format, we're gonna walk through the steps um, of how to count a little subsection and extrapolate. Um, but again, it's recommended to attempt to get an idea of how dense the cluster is by looking at it from multiple angles. Um, and then this is another reason why it's important to attend an in-person training if there's one in your area or to pair up with an experienced counter um, after this online training if it's your first time. So here we've um, picked an area that's uh, reasonable to count and counted 15 butterflies in this part of the cluster. And next, we identify similarly sized areas throughout the cluster um, and have identified five additional areas. So in total, we have six similarly sized areas. Um, and now we can extrapolate by multiplying our 15 monarchs in the first area by six, which gives us 90 monarchs in this one cluster. Again, if you can get another angle, either from below or the other side to see how deep it is, um, that would be ideal for a more accurate count. And after coming up with your estimate, repeat these steps and take the average of your two counts. Then you compare your count and notes with your partner um, to come up with uh, the best estimate. So after you've estimated your one 
to account for the one cluster, you record that number on your data sheet, and you'll repeat that process for the remaining clusters, each one getting an individual line on that data sheet. For our next example, we will be looking at a Monterey Cypress branch. Uh, Monterey Cypress is one of the more desirable trees because it is native to the central coast of California. Um, it has sturdy limbs that can help protect clustered monarchs from uh, gusty winds, from storms, and it, it by providing more stability for these clustered monarchs. Um, so this cluster looks a little different than the last one. Instead of being broken up into multiple clusters, uh, the monarchs are in one larger group here. So again, we're going to pick an area um, that is reasonable to accurately count. And here we've identified 20 butterflies. Um, so we visually estimate that area that contains 20 butterflies and then proceed to identify similarly sized areas throughout this cluster. Um, and have, we've picked out 16 or identified 16 additional areas. Um, so we have a total of 17 for this cluster. So we can extrapolate by multiplying our 20 monarchs that were counted by 17, which gives us 340 monarchs in this one cluster. Um, again, it's recommended to get another angle. This could be a relatively deep uh, cluster and there could be multiple layers of monarchs. Um, after coming up with your estimate, repeat the, these steps and then uh, take the average of the two. Then you compare your count with your partner and record the average if they're within a 20% margin of each other. For our last example, we are going to look at uh, clusters on eucalyptus branches. For ease of counting, we will count the branches separately. Uh, in the field, I would recommend starting on the left side or the right side of the tree and working your way across um, so you don't lose your spot. But for this example, I went with the middle branch, as you can see here. Um, so we'll start by counting an area of the branch, and we have counted 20 monarchs here um, with these red dots. And then we can visually estimate um, the area that contains 20 monarchs. And to help um, to help, uh, well, we've identified four additional similarly sized areas in the rest of this branch. Um, so now we can extrapolate that number again by multiplying our 20 monarchs in the first area by five, which gives us 100 monarchs. Um, on this one cluster or branch. Again, it's recommended to get an, uh, a view from another angle um, to arrive at a more accurate count. And again, after coming up with your estimate and average uh, with your partner, you, you should average your count with your partner's count um, for the final number, and then you repeat these steps for the remaining branches. So, after you've filled out your data sheet with all your different count numbers and tree species, um, you can submit your data in a couple of ways. You can scan it and send it to WMTC at Xerces.org and staff at Xerces will enter it into the database. The second way to submit data is to visit the Western Monarch Count, is to visit westernmonarchcount.org um, and at the website, you'll select a tab that says Help Count Monarchs Submit Your Data. And there's a site-specific data sheet um, for the count and for the habitat assessment. So that, will, that link will lead you to this interactive form where you will fill in the different fields. And then this information is sent to us as an Excel or a CSV file, and we, can, and we enter into the database. You can also submit data using the Monarch SOS app. Um, from the same submit your data page, you'll see a link to the Monarch SOS app. Here is a screenshot of what the app looks like um, that you'll want to download. And after downloading, you get a list of options, um, a, a list from monarchs to lookalike butterflies, 
milkweed, uh, other programs, and report. And so when submitting data, you'll want to select report. It has a little pencil image, and if you click that, multiple projects pop up where you can select Western Monarch Thanksgiving count and enter the site name, observers, count time, um, number of monarchs clustered, et cetera. Um, the last step is to share your experience and check back for updates. Every Western Monarch Count volunteer is serving as an ambassador for monarchs. So we really encourage everyone to talk with your neighbors or folks at overwintering sites um, to spread the word and just raise awareness. Another way to share your experience or check for updates is by visiting um, a few of the social media outlets. There is a Western Monarch Count Facebook page where updates and news articles are posted, and it can help serve as a platform to connect people in the Western Monarch community. If you are social media savvy, you can use the hashtag Save Western Monarchs to raise awareness, um, or you can send us an email with your monarch related experience, um, which you can see all the emails listed here. Um, and this wraps up the count portion of the presentation. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time going over the habitat assessment form. This is done in addition to a count. The, um, it can be done on the same day after your count. Um, so the first step is to fill out the data sheet to the best of your ability. Again, feel free to skip sections, but please note why. Um, you could have run out of time or you didn't have the necessary equipment, and any of those things are fine. Um, if you're unsure on any of the information, it's better to leave it blank because no information is better than inaccurate information. Um, and the majority of the items listed on the data form are self-explanatory. I'm going to go over the short form here, but there's a longer form available online for um, additional information about the habitat assessment, um, and you can read a detailed protocol for reference. And if you have any questions about filling out either of these forms, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. So the first section of the data sheet includes the date when you are assessing the habitat, the site name, and site ID. Again, this information can be found on the Find and Overwintering Site interactive map or by contacting your regional coordinator or Xerces at WMTC at Xerces.org. And it's written right there on the step two. In the next section, you will record the county you are in, the property owner. Um, this can be a public agency, such as the Forest Service or California Department of Parks and Recreation. It could be a private landowner. Um, a homeowner or a business owner or a nonprofit. So um, we typically have this information unless that changed hands. Um, so it's always good to update. And then you and your partner's name will go under the observer's um, line there and record your start and end time. If you have access to a Kestrel pocket weather meter that I mentioned earlier or a similar device, please use that to collect the weather data. Uh, if you do not have access to um, a device like that, you can record, that can record those measurements. Um, skip the relative humidity and dew point data fields and just use an outdoor thermometer to record the temperature data. And the next section here is extremely important to help us update the coordinates for each site every year. Uh, grove size and shape can change due to development and construction projects. Um, there can be structural changes within the grove if trees are aging or a combination of factors. Uh, if you have access to a GPS unit or a smartphone, please provide uh, GPS coordinates of the site. Um, if you do not have access to a GPS unit, you can skip this section, but most smartphones have the capacity to provide coordinates, which makes it a lot easier. And the next section helps identify the conditions of an overwintering site by collecting information on the community structure. 
um, by asking questions like, is there a buffer between the cluster trees and predominant winds? So surrounding trees can serve as a buffer um, to clustered monarchs from wind and rain, which is important in helping them conserve their energy to make it through the winter. Uh, we also ask, do the cluster trees get morning sunlight? This is important to note as dense growth can block light and prevent monarchs from receiving sufficient dappled sunlight. Um, we also ask, are there dead, diseased, or hazard trees in the grove? Um, aging or diseased Aging or diseased trees um, can lose limbs, or when they die, they can make the sites less suitable for overwintering monarchs. So um, we want to track that as much as we can so that these sites can be managed um, for future use, so they're su suitable in the future. Uh, we also ask if there's fresh water nearby. This can include streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, um, abundant dew. We also ask about nectar plants. Um, as the temperatures get warmer during the day, monarchs do leave the clusters and are looking for uh, resources. So uh, nectar plants are very important. Um, we also know, want to know what they are. Um, and lastly, we ask that you list any threats or disturbances to the site. This includes cut or trim trees. Uh, could be trees diseased um, by cankers or infested by beetles. Could be these older aging trees, um, any erosion problems or construction going on at the site, um, pesticide use, all the threats that Emma mentioned earlier in the presentation would be good to include. Um, and then there's the additional notes section can really include anything you feel is important to let us know about the site. Um, it could include visible disturbance in the landscape, so areas outside of the overwintering site itself, um, and that could include highways or high traffic, housing development that's maybe encroaching the overwintering site, um, you know, pesticide use in the landscape that could maybe have a drift effect. So any notes here that seem relevant. And Lastly, again, the most important part is to submit your data. Um, again, you can uh, scan it and email it to us at wmtc at xerces.org. Um, or you can mail us a hard copy of either the count or the habitat assessment form if you prefer that. Um, the other option, again, is to visit westernmonarchcount.org. Um, and uh, fill out the online habitat assessment form. So this is under Help Count Monarchs, which you can see at the top here. Um, submit your data would be the next link you would click. And then this page will have a, a link to this online form that you see here, and also a similar link for the Monarch app if you wanted to download that onto your phone. So if this all sounds great and you plan on signing up for an overwintering site to count, um, but you're still asking, how else can I help? We have a few recommendations. Um, first, we recommend planting native milkweed. This can be in your backyard or at your workplace or school. However, if you live within five to 10 miles of the Pacific coast, which is considered outside of, the milk, of milkweed's historic range, we recommend planting fall, winter, and spring nectar sources instead of milkweed. Um, the second thing to look out for and ways that you could help is if tropical milkweed is present at an overwintering site or in your garden, we recommend, re we recommend removing it um, as its evergreen nature is associated with higher infection loads um, of the monarch parasite OE. Third, uh, you can plant native flowers like we mentioned earlier, monarchs need nectar to provide energy to migrate, breed, and overwinter. So flowers can be planted anywhere, including overwintering sites. And fourth, you can get involved in another citizen science project. There are a number of uh, different monitoring programs that are helping us learn more about Western monarchs, uh, Project Monarch Health, and the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper are just a few examples um, and 
this data that's being collected is helping us understand important breeding areas and migratory pathways, um, disease prevalence, and, and threats to breeding habitat. So if you're interested in reporting monarch observations um, beyond the Thanksgiving count um, and outside of the overwintering period, so this would be during the spring, summer, and fall, uh, you can submit any of those observations to the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. Um, so check out monarchmilkweedmapper.org, listed at the bottom of the screen here, to learn more about that project. And these records help us understand where monarchs are and where milkweed grows in the Western US. And if you're looking for additional resources about Western monarchs and how to participate, participate um, please visit westernmonarchcount.org or Monarch Milkweed Mapper. The associated email addresses are listed below the website. Um, and then Xerces and our partners have used these data sets um, to better understand monarch population trends and, and their conservation status. Um, so here are a few examples of several reports that are available for free to download. Um, the state of the monarch overwintering sites identifies the top 50 sites for conservation. Uh, this report, in addition to the others shown here, include general guidelines for managing and protecting overwintering habitat in California. Um, and there's also a best management practices for Western monarchs. So you can find these under the publication section at westernmonarchcount.org or at xerces.org. And again, the links are listed um, on the right side of the slide here. And lastly, we want to thank everyone who has helped make this long running effort possible. Uh, special thanks to Monarch Joint Venture for support and also hosting the training module today. This citizen science effort would not be possible with, without all of our amazing volunteers and partners, um, which are all listed here. So um, thank you very much for your attention today. And um, we look forward to folks joining us for this year's count.